Look at that. All right, so we're good. We're ready to get started. How's everybody doing today? You doing good, Mr. B? Good. All right, give me some thumbs up. All right, so yesterday we were talking about the Battle of Antietam, okay? This is a pivotal turning point in the war. The South needed a big victory in order to convince the European countries that they could survive. What the South needed was a Saratoga, okay? You remember back when we talked about the American Revolution, the Battle of Saratoga, that first big win by the colonists is what convinced France to support America during the Revolutionary War, okay? The, during the Civil War, Robert E. Lee, he can win defensive battles all day long, but that's not going to convince France and England to support the Confederacy. He's got to go into the Union and beat the Union Army in the North. If he does that, that might convince Britain and France to say, you know what, Confederacy, they can make it, we'll recognize them. So the surprise attack in Antietam could have been a smashing success. And the reason for that, my theory on this, is because General McClellan got the entire Confederate battle plan by, like, you know, it just happened. It was not you know, on purpose, it was an accident, okay? The, the Confederacy, one of the messengers, dropped the ball, literally dropped the plans on the ground somewhere. Some Union soldiers found it, they realized what it was, and McClellan had the game plan, okay? He knew exactly what Robert E. Lee was doing, and in the Battle of Antietam, he still couldn't win, okay? It was a stalemate. The South did not win, and the North really didn't win. It was more like a tie, but this did cause Robert E. Lee to retreat, and it defended the North, and so Antietam was not the resounding victory that Lee had wanted. It is possible that if Lee had not lost those battle plans and he had been able to surprise McClellan, that we would be living in the Confederacy right now, okay? Which is weird to think about, but it was a possibility because Lee was that talented of a general and McClellan was that bad, okay? After this, McClellan gets fired, okay? Uh, Abraham Lincoln's like, you're out of here, okay? He replaces him, but Lincoln struggles to find a capable commander, okay? There's one commander of the North called uh, Burnside. He's actually where the word sideburns come from because he had like some awesome sideburns, okay? But General Burnside, um, there's General Hooker, there's General um, Meade, there's a few different generals, but like none of them can really beat Lee the way that eventually Grant is able to. Okay, and so Lincoln spends the next few years trying to figure out who's going to be in charge of his army. Okay, so you can look at the map in your smart book, but they kind of bounce around in Northern Virginia and Maryland for a huge chunk of the war. And the Confederacy is able to win most of the battles, but it's not enough. It's not enough to, uh, it's not enough to really put the South down or give the South a victory. And so the war is becoming a stalemate in the East, which is bad for the Confederacy because the Confederacy needs a quick win for the war. It's good for the Union because the longer the war lasts, the more their blockade and their Navy can be set up, the more that their factories can produce more weapons, and the more that their advantages and population can contribute to having larger and larger Union armies. And the South is going to run out of resources run out of soldiers, run out of material, and starve out, okay? So, a longer war is better for the Union, but politically, a long war is not good for President Abraham Lincoln. He needs a win, because otherwise, there's going to be an election coming up in 1864, and if he loses the election, because he's not been a good commander of the military, things could change, all right? So, Lincoln initially is hesitant to strike at slavery in the Civil War. Remember that not all of the states that had slavery seceded. Maryland, 
Delaware, Kentucky, and, and Missouri, along with West Virginia, don't join the Confederacy but have slavery. And so if Lincoln just comes out and says slavery is bad, I want to get rid of it, he runs the risk of losing those border states and having even more rebels to deal with. But at the state, so his focus is on preserving the Union. But as this, as the war continues, things start to pressure and lead to the point where slavery gets ended. Okay. First off, Congress is attacking slavery. Okay. Congress is attacking slavery. The South and all their representatives and senators pretty much all are gone out of Washington. Okay. So, if all the people that cared about slavery walked out of the room, now there's no one to say, hey, let's protect slavery in Congress. There's nothing stopping Congress from passing laws that favor the North, okay? Part of the reason why the Transcontinental Railroad eventually goes a Northern route rather than a Southern route is because the Southern states are fighting a war, and so the Northern states, they vote to give themselves the railroad. Okay, so obviously this gives an advantage to northern interests and it gives advantage to anti-slavery forces in Congress. Okay, and as the war continues, as Union soldiers start conquering portions of the Confederacy, we see more and more slaves running away and heading to the Union Army. Okay, many slaves see this as their chance. Okay. There's a Union army coming by. We can escape slavery and head to the Union, okay? And so a lot of these slaves are what they kind of technically consider them as is contraband of war, okay? There's this concept in battle where, you know, the victor go the spoils. You take somebody's city, you can get your stuff, okay? If the South believes that slaves are property, then you just confiscated their property. Okay, and so we see these things called the Confiscation Acts. Okay, the Confiscation Act, first one is passed in December 1861. Congress prohibited federal troops from capturing or returning fugitive slaves and freed the 2,000 slaves living in the District of Columbia with compensation of their owners. In 1862, July, they passed the second Confiscation Act which declared that slaves of anyone who supported the rebellion would be freed if they came into federal custody, okay? So, this leads to anywhere the Union soldiers go, slaves are getting freed, okay? And this means that slaves who know they're close to a battle are more likely to try to run away and get to Union lines, okay? Now, Abraham Lincoln, he was, he was very much... He was very much on the fence at the first because he didn't want to alienate the border states, okay? So he emphasized state action since slavery was a domestic institution. Twice the president summoned white representatives from the border states and brought in them to support a state-sponsored program of gradual emancipation, but both times they rejected this plea. But after the Battle of Antietam, Abraham Lincoln views this as a victory. So Antietam as a battle, when you look at it strategic, like tactically, it wasn't really a victory for the Union, but strategically it was because even though they couldn't defeat the Confederate Army on the field completely, the Confederate Army retreated after that battle. So Abraham Lincoln sees this as a win. And so he says, now I've got the political capital to sign something like the Emancipation Proclamation. Okay, this is intended to be a blow that would weaken the Confederacy. The Emancipation Proclamation was specifically only intended to affect the states in rebellion. So the border states were not forced to free their slaves. But any state that was in rebellion, the slaves were free. Now, this is one of those examples of de jure and de facto. Okay. De jure, de jure is, lat, is Latin, and de facto is too, okay? But de jure means of the law, and de facto means in reality, okay? 
So, Abraham Lincoln is the president of the United States, okay? And so, as president of the United States, and because the Congress of the United States supports him, he has the de jure authority to outlaw slavery in the South. But in reality, the southern states are not following Abraham Lincoln's orders. Does that make sense? Okay. So he says, all the slaves are free. But that's just a piece of paper. Okay. For the Emancipation Proclamation to become reality, there has to be the military victories to back it up. Okay. But after this point, anywhere that slaves are, that the Union soldiers capture in the South, the slaves are free. And this is a way to weaken the power of the Confederacy. Get rid of their slaves or take away their slaves that they've been using for their economy, you reduce their ability to wage war, okay? So Abraham Lincoln intends this as a military blow to the Confederacy. But what this also does is it creates a huge morale boost for the Civil War. Now, it's not just about preserving the Union, it's also about freeing the slaves and bringing liberty to the people in captivity, okay? So, all slaves within rebel lines would be freed unless the seceded states returned to the Union by January 1st, 1863. This excluded slave states and areas under the Confederacy under Union control. Because Lincoln justified the proclamation on military grounds, he believed there was no legal right to apply it to areas not in rebellion. Okay? So, there are mixed reactions to the proclamation. Some people liked it, especially abolitionists, especially African Americans, but some people didn't like it. Okay? Right? Many of the Northern Democrats really, really didn't like it, okay? Because for them, they were already sympathetic to slavery, and there's a lot of racism in the United States. And a lot of people don't want the Civil War to be over slavery. So this is politically divisive at first. But over time, and history especially, has seen this as the right call, okay? Use this opportunity of the war to really, really end this cruel and inhumane institution that has been in the United States for so long, okay? Now, as the Civil War continues, slavery starts to disintegrate, okay? Everywhere the Union Army goes, the slave, this institution of slavery falls apart. At the same time, a lot of white Southerners are off fighting in the war and so there's less and less monitoring. And there's less and less like, control that can be exerted on African Americans. It becomes more and more likely for African Americans to run away, to undermine their, you know, their masters, and to, you know, do everything they can to end the war quicker and get their freedom. Okay. And lots and lots and lots of African Americans flee to Union lines, as many as half a million. Many of them actually end up helping out the Union Army, working for them and working to help in the war. At the same time, the Confederacy will use slaves to do things like build forts or do work to support the military effort. At the very, very last moment when the Confederacy is like absolutely desperate, they even start trying to arm slaves and use them to fight against the Union. And it actually happens. Like there are some black Confederate soldiers, which is weird, but it happened. Okay. Now, most African Americans that have fought in the Civil War fought for the North. Okay. Abraham Lincoln, he announced after adopting the policy of emancipation that African Americans would be accepted in the Navy and the Army. Okay. So, there, were, there was a lot of resistance among white voters that, that black volunteers should be allowed to enter into the army. But Frederick Douglass spoke for the vast majority when he argued that once a black man had served in the army, there was no power on earth 
which can deny that he has earned the right of citizenship in the United States. A lot of people didn't want black people to serve in the army because they thought if they serve in the army, then they'll be citizens and they can vote. Especially there's some Northern Democrats who do not like the idea of African-Americans being equal to white Americans. And so there is some resistance, but the fact remains that the North is in the middle of a war. They need manpower, they need soldiers, and thousands of African-Americans joined the army, joined the military. Nearly 200,000 African-Americans served the Union in segregated units with white officers, okay? All black regiments. In many of these, reg in these regiments, these soldiers, they can see, they, they form about 10% of the military's total manpower, okay? Now, what's interesting is that African-Americans end up entering into some of the hardest and most difficult battles. At first, they were given undesirable duties, such as heavy labor and burial details, but black soldiers successfully lobbied for the chance to fight. They impressed white troops with their courage under fire, okay? Now here's a quote from a union officer. I have been one of those men who never had much confidence in colored troops fighting, but these doubts are now all removed, for they fought as bravely as any troops in the fort. In the end, 37,000 African-American servicemen gave their lives, a rate of loss about 40% higher than among white soldiers. Black recruits had good reason to fight fiercely. They knew that the freedom of their race hung in the balance, and they hoped to win civil rights at home by their performance on the battlefield. They resented racist sneers about their loyalty and ability, and they knew that capture might mean death. Okay, For a white Union soldier, if you got captured by the Confederacy, you probably get thrown into prison and, you know, you have a, a chance of survival. But a black Union soldier that gets captured by a Confederate soldier probably just going to get killed, okay? So black soldiers, they fought a lot harder. They're fighting not just for the Union, but they're fighting for the freedom of their race. And they're fighting to gain, to like prove to everyone that they deserve civil rights and they deserve freedom, okay? One of the most famous African-American regiments is the 54th Massachusetts. Okay, there's a movie about them called, I think it's called Glory. Um, it's a Washington's in it. I think Matthew Broderick's in it. Anyways, and they like, you know, they, there is a lot, a lot, a lot of African-Americans who even win like the medal. I believe there's one that wins the Medal of Honor in that movie. Anyways, but um, there's a lot of African-Americans that serve in the Civil War for the Union. Okay, there's a picture, Vaughn, we get all this done. All right, now, the Civil War changes the economy in both the North and the South. For the South, they realize that they really need to up their game as far as factories go, okay? They realize a little bit too late that, hey, maybe it was a bad idea to focus our whole economy on cotton because now we need rifles, okay? And so the Confederate War Department built and ran factories took over mines and regulated manufacturers. The Confederate government actually started doing things, but um, basically like taking over, like nationalizing industries, okay? Like, you know, the, the mines in the Confederacy, the government's running, okay? The factories, the government's running. Government-run factories would be something that before the Civil War, the Democratic Party in the South would have like flipped out over. The government wants to open it, run a factory. The government wants to nationalize a mine. That's awful. We want a limited federal government. That's what the South was all about. Limited federal government, state rights. But in order to survive in the Civil War, they have to like go back on these principles because they need guns, okay? And so the South does actually build a lot of, build a lot of factories and do a lot of work to really change their country. And a lot of Southerners have to make a lot of sacrifices in order to survive in the war, but it's not enough to compete with the pre-existing massive factories in the North, okay? For Southern women, there is a, lot, a more active role that they can play in the war. Some Southern women gained notoriety, no, notoriety as spies. Others smuggled military supplies into the South. Women also spent a good time, amount of time making the clothing and uniforms for the soldiers. A lot of them knit. Robert E. Lee's wife, 
like the whole war, his wife spent her time knitting socks for Confederate soldiers. Because the Confederate soldiers, they were very, very low supply. It is really surprising how much the Confederates fought when they were like running out of everything. They're like soldiers were like starving. They like, didn't have shoes. They barely had guns. They barely had enough bullets, okay? Like Union soldiers, they were all getting like brand new rifles with like everybody had the same rifle. In a Confederate regiment, you know, people use what they had. And so they might have some guns that they bought from England, some leftover guns from before the Civil War. Maybe they fought a battle and they captured some Union rifles. And so they have like this hodgepodge of different bullets and different, you know, materials. And, you know, Confederate soldiers, if they won a battle, they'd go and they'd find Union soldiers and they'd steal their pants. Okay, dead Union soldiers because like they need pants. Now they wouldn't put the Union jackets on because then they have a blue jacket on and they get shot by their fellow Confederates. You know, the Confederates, if they had nice uniforms, they'd be gray or brown. Okay. But a lot of times they just wore their clothes, homespun cloth, you know. And so with like gray, brown, hodgepodge, you know with like, you know, just random people in the army. Whereas the Union soldiers, they were all wearing their nice, you know, blue outfits, you know, sometimes they had red pants, you know, but Confederates, like, they'd steal Union shoes. They'd like, they, they were just constantly scrambling for resources, constantly. With large numbers of their husbands gone, many, uh, many Southern women had to take on new responsibilities and opportunities, okay, all right. And a lot of war opened up for uh, the war opened up jobs off the farm, working in factories, working as like nurses and stuff. If you've seen the movie, okay, you know, Gone with the Wind, you know, Scarlett O'Hara, you know, all the men go off to fight the war and she's kind of in charge of the plantation or whatever. And then, you know, she helps work in the hospitals during the end of the war or whatever. But I mean, things like that actually happen, okay? Yeah, they make it way you know, dramatic. Have you ever seen Vampire Diaries? What? Have you ever seen Vampire Diaries? No. Oh, you're missing out. Yeah. Missing out. Missing out. They have an episode in the Civil because they're vampires. Yeah, that's, that's all. Yeah. Yeah. The only vampire show that I really ever was into was Being Human, but I never finished it. You like why? Being Human was like about this vampire and a werewolf, and they had an apartment together, and the apartment was haunted, and it had a ghost. It was like a weird. It was actually really good, but in like you know, they're like best friends. They're like you know, like hey, it was like you know, bro. They had adventures. Anyways, but no, it was a it's a real show. It was actually pretty good, um, but anyways, I haven't finished it. All right, let's talk about the Confederacy, the Confederate home front again. The most serious, one of the most serious problems for the South was financing the war. They needed money. And the South had always been against tariffs and taxes. They wanted low taxes. But now in the Civil War, they have to raise taxes. They actually adopt a graduated income tax, right? They start impressing people in the military. It's crazy. The South has to pay their bills, so they start printing off a lot of money, and there's massive inflation in the South. Confederate money becomes hardly worth the paper that it is printed on, okay? Because their printed money was not backed up with silver and gold, okay? There's a lot of centralization of power in the Confederacy, and so in many ways, this is very ironic, okay? Prices are going up. People's civil rights are being taken away from them. And the Confederacy passes the first national conscription law in American history in 18, April 1862, drafting all white males between 18 and 35 unless exempted. As the war continued and they were running out of people, they extended the draft from people between 17 and 50. Virtually the entire military age white population had to fight in the Civil War unless they could like pay for a replacement or find some reason why they couldn't go. Like, you know, I'm missing a foot or whatever, you know? And so there is a lot of people that are hostile to President Jefferson Davis. His critics felt that he was destroying the principle of states' rights. 
But Jefferson Davis said, hey, we're in the middle of a war, and if we don't win, we're going to lose our entire country, so it's time to make some sacrifices, okay? And so there's like, the Confederates are like fighting themselves, and the Union is fighting themselves too while they're fighting each other, okay? So things are not going well for the Confederacy. The longer the war lasts, the worse it becomes. Food shortages became very severe as the war went on, especially among the soldiers, the typical diet of a Confederate soldier was like cornmeal and maybe a little bit of salt pork if you were lucky. Okay. All right. And, you know, you just kind of made do with what you had. And they really, really needed something called salt. You might have heard of it. Okay. Salt is essential for life. Okay. Human bodies need salt to do a lot of our essential processes. But also, this is before refrigerators. Salt is essential for preserving food like meat, okay? Salt is hard to make. You have to go, there's like a big complicated process in like processing salt and making it edible and all that stuff. And a lot of the salt being made in America was not being made in the South, okay? So that's something that you don't even think about it. But whenever you blockade a whole country, you might be able to grow some like vegetables in your garden and you know, raise pigs in your backyard, you got to get salt, okay? And so if you don't have a way to make it yourself, it's difficult, okay? There was, there, it, the pressure got so bad that there were even riots in the streets throughout the South, and uh, especially in April 1863 in Richmond, where people were chanting bread and looting stores. Anyway, so the South is, is struggling throughout the war. Okay, it is a rough period of time. Meanwhile, in the Union, things were not necessarily just gravy, but things were better, okay? The government institutes the first federal income tax to pay for the war. They start selling war bonds, which are loans that you give to the government that after the war, they pay you back. That's an idea that they use. And they start printing a lot of money, and we get a national bank. Andrew Jackson is foiled again, okay? Remember Andrew Jackson? He was like, let's get rid of the national bank, okay? And he got rid of the national bank. Well, the Civil War happened, and we needed a bank. So we get a new national bank, okay? All right? At the same time, now that there's basically only Republicans in Congress, okay, they don't have to worry about pesky Democrats getting in their way. So Republican policies get implemented all across the country, okay? All right, you start to see economic development being encouraged because, you know, like the Republican Party, their big thing is they want to use the government to improve business in America, okay? They want businesses and the economy to grow, and they want the government to help out, okay? So you see more infrastructure being built. You see the development of Western states. You see the beginning of the Transcontinental Railroad, okay? The Democrats were always anti-tariffs. Well, guess what? Most of the Democrats are all fighting with the South. There's not enough Democrats left in the North to stop them. So let's jack up those tariffs and let's protect Northern industry, okay? So like the Civil War is like a blessing for the North in some ways because they don't have to deal with the South getting in their way, and they get to institute their vision for the country, okay? Including the Homestead Act. We're going to talk about the Homestead Act probably a lot next semester, but I just want to put this in your mind. In 1862, Congress sets up a plan that gives away 160 acres of free land to anyone that settles in the Western territories. And if you're married, you get double. If you have a kid, you get 80 acres for each kid. So a married couple with two kids could get almost 500 acres of free land. All they have to do is move out to the West and start a farm and live there for five years. And then they have the land, it's theirs, okay? They have to pay like a little fee for the paperwork or whatever, but it's pretty much completely free. So that's an awesome deal. And it encourages the settlement of the West even more, okay? You start to, you see the land-grant college act, um, land-grant colleges, basically there's like extra federal land, it's given to a college, and that's used to like finance a college, 
and more colleges get set up, that sort of thing. All right, um, trying to get through this because we've got only tomorrow to finish this. All right, rich men's war. This war actually leads to the beginning of what we call the Gilded Age in American history, where we see a lot of big businesses developing and monopolies developing in the, in the United States. And a lot of the big business tycoons of the Industrial Revolution, they get their start in the Civil War, okay? Like J.P. Morgan, Andrew Carnegie, um, who's the other guy? Uh, John D. Rockefeller. I believe all of those guys ended up getting their start around the Civil War. Not so sure about John D. Rockefeller, but Andrew Carnegie and J.P. Morgan, I believe, were both involved in the Civil War. Not as so much as soldiers, but as like producing military weapons. So a lot of people make a fortune opening up factories and instead of making, you know, shoes for, you know, people to wear just like normal shoes, making boots for the military or building rifles or building cannons or building military warships and stuff like that. So the economy is booming, business is booming, farmers are prospering in the north because now the Union Army is buying food for all these soldiers. There's lots of demand for food. So farms are growing. But at the same time, there's a lot of corruption, okay? All right, there's a cozy relationship between business and politics, okay? Politicians who might own their own factory, you know, get a law passed that says we're gonna buy uniforms from this factory. There's a lot of like double dealing and people that are in government buying contracts with businesses that they own, a lot of, you know, corruption and fraud is going on. And at least 20% of government expenditures involve fraud during the Civil War. A lot of people make a lot of money. War is expensive. Somebody's getting paid, okay? And so people that are making the guns and making the uniforms and making the stuff, they stand to make a killing. All right, um, moving on. But this does lead to a boom in the Northern industrial economy that continues after the Civil War, okay? As men leave to go fight in the war effort, there's more demand for women in the workplace. 100,000 new jobs are filled by women. This is a theme that you get to see a lot in American history. This happens again in World War I, and it happens a lot in World War II. That during wartime, there's opportunities for women to have greater you know, participation in the economy, okay? Women start to serve as nurses much more prominently in the Civil War. All of a sudden, there's a demand for nurses. Why? Well, people are getting shot. Okay? A lot of people are getting shot. They need doctors and nurses. And so there's a huge demand for nurses, and women fill that demand. Okay? This, you start to see what still exists today, this sort of bias in our minds. When I say the word nurse, and I want you to imagine a nurse, you're probably imagining a woman, unless like you know someone who's a man who's a nurse. Okay, but when you think about nurses, think about women, okay? During the Civil War, there's lots of women that work as nurses on the battlefield, okay? There's also a greater demand for women to be teachers, okay? And this again, when you hear the word teacher, now, right now, we have a man teacher, okay? But a lot of times when you think, oh, a teacher, you think of a woman. Okay. Isn't your brother a nurse? My brother is a nurse. Yes. So there you go. We're, we are we are bucking gender roles right here. Okay. All right. Anyways, moving on. Um, but there is a greater demand for women to be teachers as men are off fighting in the war. Now, with, now for people that are running the schools, this is a great deal because you don't have to pay women as much. Okay. That's how it was back then. You pay women about half to two thirds of what a male would earn. And there's lots of women that are willing to do this job. And after the Civil War, women increasingly enter teaching and teaching becomes an increasingly female profession. There are also women that volunteer to serve in the military. This is something that um, is talked about a lot. Like it, yeah, like Mulan moments, okay? These things happened, okay? <laughs> It wasn't like just like all the women were dressing up as men and, and fighting in the war, but it did happen on both sides. What was also very common was camp women. 
okay? Women who would follow the military camps around and they would find work, okay? So like uh, the soldiers would have money and their chores to do in the camp. And so a lot of times they would hire women to do it. They'd hire women to cook for them, clean for them, do the chores for them and pay them some of their salary that they got from being a soldier. Also, there are other camp women that provide other services to the soldiers, okay? One of the most common causes of death in the Civil War was not bullets, but venereal disease, or STDs. How do all these soldiers get STDs? Well, do I need to go over it or do y'all need this? Okay, all right. Basically, there's a lot of prostitutes, okay? And there's a lot of soldiers that use the prostitutes and then a lot of STDs, okay? All right, so that happens a lot. So these things are going on in the Civil War. All right, now, on the home front, there is a lot of things that have to change during the Civil War. During a war, you can't just operate like business as usual. You're fighting a war. Sacrifices have to be made if you're gonna win. The suspension of the writ of habeas corpus that Abraham Lincoln did was seen as tyrannical by Democrats, okay? The writ of habeas corpus protects you from like just being arrested for no reason and thrown in jail for no reason and never knowing why you've been thrown in jail, okay? But during the war, we don't have time to like get a warrant, have a trial, throw someone in jail. Sometimes it's just like you just round people up, okay? Because we're fighting the war, okay? Things have to be done. But Democrats attack Lincoln as a tyrant. And there's a lot of people who oppose Abraham Lincoln's prosecution of the war. There's even some Northern Democrats who oppose the war in general. They said, let's let the South secede. It's their right. Why are we fighting this war? Democrats who opposed the Civil War were called copperheads. This was originally intended as an insult, like a copperhead, like sitting back and striking like they were dangerous and evil and bad. Now, but the copperheads eventually like embraced the title. They're like, yeah, we're snakes, okay? <laughs> That's cool. So they embraced it, but the copperheads condemned a lot of things about the war. These people ranged from, I don't like how Lincoln is fighting the war to I don't even like the war at all. But many people disagreed with the way that soldiers were selected under the draft, okay? So a draft is when people are forced to serve in the military. Different drafts operate differently. So like the Confederacy, they were just like everybody's in the army now, okay? But in the North, it was like a lottery, okay? And you had like numbers, your number could come up. But if you had money, you could buy a you could buy a proxy, someone to go and serve in the military for you. So the way it worked is that most of the people that fight in the war, a lot of them that were drafted were poor. And rich people could get out of fighting. And so people thought, especially the Democrats, they felt that the war was a war of privilege and that rich people are making money off the war. Okay, making the weapons and selling them, and poor people are having to go fight and die in this war. Okay, and this actually led to a full scale riot in July of 1863. Okay, when the first draftees' names were drawn in New York City, workers in the Irish Quarter rose in anger, rampaging the streets. The mob attacked draft officials and prominent Republicans, ransacked African American neighborhoods, and lynched black residents who fell into its hands. By the time this this riot lasted for four days and at least 105 people have been killed, this is the worst riot in American history as far as the loss of life goes. Okay, so we're headed towards the turning point. Things are going bad for both sides, but again, the longer the war lasts, the more it is, the more it benefits the North. Okay. Soldiers on both sides of the war were mostly young farmers and farm laborers, okay? For the Confederate soldiers, most of the soldiers probably never even had a slave, okay? But most of these people take patriotism seriously, okay? 
Southerners, Southerners, they felt they were defending their home from Northern aggression. In fact, one of the Southern names for the Civil War is the War of Northern Aggression, that the North is just bullying the South, okay? And so Southerners felt like they were defending their home. Meanwhile, Northerners felt that they were preserving the Union that they had been living in and fought for for so long. And as the war continued, Union soldiers increasingly supported abolition of slavery because it's because of a lot of reasons. But number one, they're fighting this war. They're serving their commander in chief. They have a lot of loyalty to Abraham Lincoln. Number two, these soldiers who are fighting in this war, they are seeing slaves escape. And they're hearing the stories of what slavery is like. And for a lot of Northerners who had never been to the South, they only knew about slavery on paper or in theory. They didn't know the scars. They, you know, they saw African Americans who like showed them their scars from being whipped. Okay. They saw African American children that, you know, had been working on the cotton fields their whole life and had been suffering. Like, they saw it firsthand. And so as the war continued, they're more and more increasingly like, let's get rid of slavery. Also, as they fight in this war, you know, there's more and more resentment towards the South for fighting. They have brothers in combat that they have lost, okay? And so anything to hurt the South, anything like getting rid of slavery, it becomes more and more palatable to them. So you see more and more support for emancipation. Disease kills more soldiers in the Civil War than bullets does, by far. Okay, poor sanitation, miserable food, exposure to the elements, and primitive medical care all led to death. Okay, one of the big things that would happen is infection. Okay, you're out in a dirty battlefield, you get shot by a dirty lead ball. Okay, you have an open wound, and you're probably wearing dirty clothes anyways, you're going to get infected. Gangrene could take a wound that, like just getting shot in the foot. You're probably not going to die from that, but then you get infected and it kills you, okay? So amputation was like one of the most popular forms of medical treatment. You got shot in the arm, it's got to come off. If we don't cut it off, it's going to get infected and you're going to die, okay? All right? And so there ain't no anesthesia, okay? Or not a whole lot of it, okay? So here's a piece of leather, bite on it, we're going to cut your leg off, okay? That happens a lot, okay? Cut your arm off, okay? Surgeons had to be fast, okay? Right? You gotta be fast at cutting off that leg as fast as you go. Like, this is something that was very common. And conditions were considerably worse in Confederate hospitals. Again, they had been, like, they didn't have as many supplies, they didn't have as much stuff, they couldn't do as much help as they could for the rest of the, uh, as the North could. My thing is, like, if you get shot and then they cut your leg off, what about that incision? Well, that incision don't so, so you got shot on the battlefield and you're like rolling around in the mud and you got, you know, it's all nasty and stuff. You get to the hospital, they cut off your leg, maybe they can keep it clean. Okay. But again, they didn't understand everything about like germs and infection the way that we do. And so, like, they knew, like, if it's dirty and it starts to turn green, it's bad. Okay. But they didn't understand everything the same way that we do today, where we're like, well, obviously you can disinfect it there or do this or do that. You know, today, you know, we don't just cut people's legs off unless like we absolutely have to. Now it happens. But today, when someone gets like amputated, it's usually because like their limb was mangled. You know, like they step, like a soldier in Afghanistan steps on a landmine, somehow they survive, but their leg is just shreds. You know, then they might just. It off, you know, like they don't, but back then it was like you got shot in the arm, we gotta take it off, but or else you're gonna get infected and die. In the fighting, there's an increasing decline of morality in some ways. Okay, a lot of these soldier boys, they're you know, they're living every day like it's their last. There's an increase in alcoholism, and there is an increase in prostitution, but at the same time. If you know that today might be your last day to live, there's also an increase in religious observance, okay? okay? And there's a lot of soldiers who find solace and comfort in God, okay? Because they are about to be ready to meet him tomorrow, so you might want to be ready, 
okay? There are no atheists in foxholes, okay? You may think you don't believe in God, but when you're getting shot at and you're in a, and you're in a you know, hole and there's bad guys coming, you pretty quickly talk, start talking to God one way or another, okay? So no atheists in foxholes. So we see this thing's going on. All right, we'll stop there. Tomorrow we should be able to finish the war. We've kind of talked about the home front and the soldiers. So tomorrow we should be able to talk about the battles. Then we can take a test on Monday. It'll be a great time, okay? If so, it needs help on your papers. Fourth period and first period. I have time where I can talk to y'all. Okay?